I did, I, I changed both my title and the data that I was originally planning on talking about. So my apologies, but I am still talking about carbon and, um, and in the rocky serpentinite subsea floor, but just a little bit different story than my original plan because I have some new data that I'm excited to share. Um, so just to situate where I'm coming from in terms of serpentinization and some of the questions I'm interested in is first of all, these questions of how the production of carbon that's associated with serpentinization leads to abiotic organic carbon synthesis and chemoautotrophic growth in the subsea floor. And part of what interests me of it is this idea that if life evolved on Earth or on other planetary bodies, that there had to be some pathway from which we went from some chemical precursors into some early biomarkers and an organic background that then kind of progresses through more and more complex biological-like materials, and that one of the locations that has been proposed as a place for this happening is in these types of ultramafic environments, and um, that when you have hot reduced alkaline fluids, you can have the organic, because we know we can have organic synthesis of some organic molecules in the absence of life, that maybe this started the path towards early life on Earth. And so some of my overarching questions that I try and address in my research in general is if life was, if life started in serpentinite hosted systems and that's analogous to early life, trying to look at what's there now and see if we can gain insights into how early life may, what types of metabolisms thrive in these types of environments and what types of insights that might give us into early life. Um, but then also from this bottom up question, which organic molecules form abiotically and under what conditions? And so try and kind of address this type of pathway from those two directions. And so the data set I wanted to talk about today is from Expedition 357 that was took place in October 2015 with co-chief scientist Beth Orcutt and Gretchen Fru Green. And in it, we drilled a series of boreholes across the Atlantis Massif. So here's the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and we drilled different boreholes um, across what we know is a place that there is the exposure of ultramafic rocks, um, and then some up towards the north. And then the Lost City hydrothermal field is situated right here. And this is a high pH system that, that has high, uh, relative, somewhat medium temperature fluids, about 90 degrees, um, that again is influenced by these ultramafic processes. And it's located here in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And so some of these borehole sites are closer to the Lost City hydrothermal field. Some of them are further away and closer to the spreading center. And so these are what I'm going to show some data from. And, um, and one of the things that's unusual from the cores that we recovered is that if you look at the Lost City hydrothermal field and the deposits, the chimney deposits that are there, there's quite abundant life in the chimney deposits. If you look at the cores themselves, um, there's very low cell counts in that rocky subsurface. So the cell counts of that crustal, of that um, rocky material are on the order of literally 10 cells per grams of rock. And Yuki Morono did um, some amazing work trying to really get at very low cell counts with fidelity um, up to about a, a thousand cells per grams of rock. So it's, um, it's a very sparse material. And one of the things that we did when we were collecting these cores is to collect the fluids that were in the liner, the core barrel liner, um, because each core barrel came up as its own unit, it was capped. Um, and so looking at these fluids kind of analogously to pore waters. And what we found when we looked at those, I started by looking at the concentrations of organic acids in these fluids because at places like Lost City and other and the Van Damme field and Oman, we know that the fluids in these um, in these locations have high concentrations of organic acids, particularly formate and acetate. 
And so as you look at the liner fluids, um, the concentrations of formate were, you know, somewhat high in various places. And they're kind of in that range. They come up to the range of approximately what's in Moss City and member fluids. And we were trying to think of some of these drill um, core liner drill fluids as potentially accessing the stock work of the Lost City system. So, um, so if if we think about where formate may form abiotically, we thought that we might be able to directly access um, those locations. And you do get some elevated formate. What was very interesting though, is that you also get extremely elevated acetate concentrations. Um, so acetate is the two carbon organic acid and we get concentrations up to about two millimolar, um, which just for a sense of scale, dissolved inorganic carbon in the ocean is about one millimolar concentration. So we're getting concentrations that are twice as high as the total amount of carbon that's in deep seawater. So very, very high acetate concentrations. Um, and what and those high acetate concentrations tend to be associated with certain rock types and not others. And so we see the highest concentrations of acetate in the core barrels that were associated with recovered rocks that were Hertzbergites and metadolorites in particular. Um, we were concerned that some of those high concentrations might be due to something like contamination. And so we, we compared those concentrations. So what you're looking at here is first of all, the rock type that was recovered. Um, so each of these um, is a different um, core barrel as you're going down. And then, um, and then these are the different rock types. So on top is the calcareous sediments and then we move into some metadolorites and serpentinized Hertzbergites. And as I mentioned, the acetate concentrations are, are lower in these kind of calcareous sediments, but then as you get into metadolorites, um, they, they start increasing. And we compare, and the site of this particular core is from 69A, which is one of the holes that was, one of the boreholes that was drilled close to Lost City. Um, and so if you look at where we're seeing the highest acetate, it's in places with very low um, amounts of this PFC contamination tracer. So this was something that we added into the, um, into the drilling to try and track whether we were contaminating the um, drill cores. And these are places where there was very low concentrations of that. And so indicating that this is not carbon that's being brought in from the drilling process itself. It also tends to be places with relatively low cell counts, or at least the places where we see high acetate and high cell counts are not necessarily associated. The other, the other location that we saw very high concentrations of acetate were from um, hole 76, which is the other one of the other boreholes that was drilled very close to Lost City. Um, we unfortunately don't have PFC contamination tracer data from that particular location, but again, there's relatively low cell counts associated with that with that sample. Um, and so, one of the next things we did was try and look at the isotopes of this acetate because you can use that to start sorting out what types of processes form it. And so these are some examples. This is a figure from um, Barbara Sherwood Lawler's recent paper from Kid Creek um, and Veronique Hewer's paper from uh, looking at um, acetate in different deep sea sediments. And, um, and there's the, the kind of isotope range of processes like microbial acetogenesis come in in this type of arena. Um, very negative isotopes tend to be associated with places where there is methane oxidation and, um, and some other processes are the degradation of organic matter, which are thought to come in kind of in this range. The isotopes from 357 acetate come in right in the middle here. And this is an isotope signature that could be consistent with microbial acetogenesis. 
Um, and so that's certainly one possibility. Another possibility is obviously that there's abiotic synthesis of acetate um, that and but we don't have a good isotope signature of what that would look like at least as far as i'm aware um i was pretty excited about that this is really new data so um i'm not it's not going to be um as kind of packaged as as perhaps some other um data sets but one of the things that i did was look at beth or and jackie um Gordial published some um some data on some of the microbial communities that were recovered from these boreholes. And these are some of the metabolisms that are associated um, with the recovered, with the genes that they recovered through their, um, through their methods. And it's a heat map. And so these lighter colors are where they see an absence of these types of genes. And these darker colors are where they see um, more representation of these genes. And so one of the conclusions that they, um, that they found, and this has been found in a lot of other rocky types of environments, is that the genes associated with carbon fixation tend to be relatively sparse and relatively absent, whereas the genes associated with heterotrophy um, tend to be relatively abundant. And so even though we've always, we kind of keep thinking of the microbial communities in these systems as, um, dominantly autotrophic and fixing carbon, it may be that there's much more abundant heterotrophy. And so one of the, one of the things that they saw was that key genes in this, um, in this pathway, this glycoxylate pathway, um, were present and in many, in many of their different, in many of their different samples, um, and in many of the different uh, uh, gene combinations that they that they isolated and identified. And this uh, pathway allows microorganisms to use acetate as a sole carbon source. One of the other things that they found was this incomplete um, Wood Lunden Hall pathway. Um, and this is in one of the samples that we found high acetate. And this is this was in part associated with methanogenesis via acetate. And so one possibility is that organisms in this rocky subsea floor are adapted to be able to utilize this acetate that's present. The reason why that's really interesting um, is this hit kind of hideously complicated um, diagram, which does not is not really uh, you don't need to look at in too much depth, but this is comparing the pathway of this is this um, this uh, this pathway that is thought to be very ancient and have evolved very early on life, um, and this is kind of the the idea behind a lot of these um, papers that are looking at the relationship between serpentinization and the early synthesis of metabolic pathways, with the idea being that this portion of this acetyl-CoA pathway is conserved between both acetogens and methanogens. So acetogens take CO2, they make this methyl-CO, um, they make this compound over here. Methanogens take CO2, they make this compound over here. Um, by this series of reactions, but then this part of the pathway is the same between the two. And so part of this hypothesis is that if you start with a geologically supplied, supplied um, CH3 group like acetate or methanol, then um, you can build up this portion of the pathway and then later evolution, the splits to figure out how to take CO2 and make that methyl synthesis pathway. And so this idea that you could have acetate kind of streaming out of, out of these environments is kind of core to this idea of serpentinite hosted systems as a place for this early biotic synthesis. Um, and so that's kind of where, where we think things might be with the acetate side. Um, and the other thing we looked at in these liner fluids was amino acids. And there's a great paper by Benedicte Menez looking at some of the cores um, 
not from 357, but very nearby um, from an earlier drilling um, that found the presence of an amino acid in some of the drill core itself. And so we wanted to look at the liner fluids as well and see if there's amino acids present. And so just to give an indication, um, just to kind of situate some of the amino acid data, um, amino acids when produced by living organisms have some characteristic um, signatures. So both in terms of what types and ratios of amino acids that are synthesized. So these are, each of these is a different amino acid, serine, glycine, arginine. This is from a methanogen that was grown in culture. Um, and this is a pretty typical distribution. Organisms tend to produce more glycine and alanine than other amino acids as part of their proteins, but it tends to be about 15% of the total amino acids. Um, and these amino acids tend to predominantly be in this um, L form as opposed to the as opposed to a D form. And that's just this race is that that's just that they're mirror images of them. Life tends to produce L form amino acids, um, but things like abiotic synthesis tend to produce a mixture. And you can go from, um, from a living organism and break that down into a protein, into a peptide, which is just a string of these amino acids together. Um, and if you, oops, sorry, if you keep breaking those down, you get to these monomers. If you keep breaking them down further, you get into CO2 and, and ammonia. You can also do the reverse, obviously, and take CO2. You and the way you know life operates and abiotic synthesis operates is you start at this end, make monomers, and then string those monomers together into strings of amino acids that are peptides and protide and peptides and proteins. And so um, this is a little bit of a ugly table for which I apologize, but I just wanted to point out that these different processes that we're trying to identify, so primary production, so this is life taking carbon dioxide and making proteins. Um, this primary production tends to form amino acids that very few free amino acids, so very few of these compared to these that are stuck together. Um, they tend to have very low DL ratios, and there tends to be, um, if you add up how much glycine and alanine there is, it tends to be under 50%. And it tends to have very few non-protein amino acids. Once you take heterotrophs, so things that are eating other things, um, you still have very low free amino acids and you start increasing this DL ratio because bacteria tend to produce more, a little bit more Ds. Um, but you still have low glycine plus alanine and you start in introducing these non-protein amino acids. Um, if you take life and heat it up in anoxic conditions, you start creating a lot more free amino acids. So you start taking these and breaking them down into these. Um, and then these DL ratios start changing as well. And as you break amino acids down, you tend to produce um, glycine and alanine in particular. And abiotic experiments that have been carried out in the lab, um, mostly you form free amino acids. It's very hard to then take these free amino acids and stick them together as peptides, um, although people have succeeded in doing so. Um, the DL ratios tend to be um, much higher. They tend to form amino acids um, both D and L in somewhat equal ratios. And again, you form a lot of glycine and alanine. These are the simplest amino acids. So they're both kind of the, the, a good final breakdown product. And um, they tend to be formed first in abiotic experiments. And so as we look at the amino acids in our, um, and so just the patterns are that the percent of free amino acids tends to increase with heat and time. DL ratios increase with heterotrophy, heat, time. Um, but in general, the DL ratios of um, this type of amino acids are almost always higher than DL ratios of serine, glycine, and alanine. Um, and that you preferentially form glycine and alanine in heated sediments and abiotic experiments. And so as we look at amino acids in the liner fluids, first of all, the locations where there's elevated amino acids are different than where you find the high acetate concentrations. Um, 
but then also in the liner fluids. Okay, thanks. In the liner fluids, um, we tend to have, we start getting very high um, free amino acids as opposed to those that are bound in peptides and proteins. And we have very high constant, we get up to very high um, uh, abundances of glycine and alanine. And so we tend to have high percentages of free amino acids, high um, abundances of glycine and alanine. So that kind of excludes typical primary production and heterotrophy, at least as a, as a first step. Um, the other thing to note though as well is that this ratio, this DL ratio of serine and, um, and GLX, um, these increase in this kind of, um, these increase in this very particular way, but that of, um, oops, but that of the, uh, that of the ASP um, operates in a very, in kind, it's, Sorry, I'm I'm gonna go back to the the um these these ASX ratios are almost always higher than the DL ratios of serine, glycine, and alanine, and so um, and so what we're looking for in heterotrophy heat and time is that these ratios should be higher than those of serine, glycine, and alanine, and when we look at that, these these ratios, this is another way of saying this um, ASX should be should be higher than um, than those of alanine and they're they're not. And so that is um, an indication that at least in terms of traditional ways, this is not um, this is not heating. This is not just due to heating, or at least not due to heating in ways that are kind of traditionally um, thought of or experimentally done so far. Um, so as I said, this is all very, some of this is very new data. And so we're still working on some of our interpretations, but what we can say is that acetate reaches extremely high concentrations and it's apparently decoupled from high cell counts. We see amino acids in the liner fluids, but their signatures are not easily explained by primary production, heterotrophy, heating, or sorption. Um, and we don't really have, um, a, we don't, we're still building, um, we're still trying to look at the literature and some other indications to figure out exactly what's going on. But I think something interesting is going on. And we're, we're looking for more experimental studies and trying to carry out some more experimental studies as well to look at how these signatures change under the conditions that we would expect at the, at the rocky subsurface. So with that, I want to thank the folks that did um, that did some of the work on some of these analyses at University of South Carolina and the entire team of IODP 357, which was which um, was a really exciting expedition to be on to the Atlantis Massif. Uh, it's it's about um, it's kind of an, an an overview of a of maybe current um, thinking on 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 how serpentinization occurs in middle-sneak ridge detachment faults, and and the questions I will uh, um, address are how much serpentinization should is taking place? Uh, can we get an idea of what rates it it takes place? Uh, and where, and also uh, a little bit at what temperatures and, and what water work ratios. And it's uh, it's a work that is uh, kind of taking a little bit on on a lot of uh, of of previous works by PhD students and and collaborators. And so so the first slide shows you uh, a very nice picture of a of a currently active detachment fault at the axis of the Mid Atlantic Ridge. Um, it's at 13 degrees north, and and you see, I, I don't know if you can see my my pointer. Yes, no? we can. That's okay. You don't. You don't. No, we see it. It's okay. Okay, well, that's good. So so you see this uh, this corrugated surface that comes 
comes out that emerges from the seafloor of the hanging wall plates on, on this side that's covered by basalt. And uh, this, this corrugated surface that forms a dome, it exposes uh, uh, um, serpentinized peridotite, but also gabbroic intrusions, uh, dolerites, etc. And, and that's kind of a cartoon showing you uh, what, what's, what's going on there. Oops. Uh oh, it looks like I'm okay. So before I start, I just want to stress uh, what what the um, significance of, of of serpentinization at at detachment fault may be, and uh, in order to be able to assess it, you we need to know. Uh, I, I need to bring maybe some of you up to to know uh, the uh, prevalence of detachment faulting at middle sink ridges. So the first thing is that uh, they only occur at slow spreading ridges, and but these represent about 50% of the current 60,000 kilometers of, of ridges that we have on Earth. So it's quite a lot. And 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 then uh, and, and and then if you look off axis, so not at, at what is currently happening, but but what has been happening in the recent past, in the I mean recent for geologists, uh, they so 200, 000, 200 million years if you want. Uh, is um, is they represent about 20 25 percent 23 percent of the of the total present surface of present day uh, oceanic lithosphere, and then in this realm of slow spreading uh, lithosphere, the 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 middle scenic ridge uh, detachment faults they occur mostly, and I show you here a, a, a map of the mid Atlantic ridge uh, that shows that the ridge the actual the the ridge the ridge, that's the black lines, it's actually segmented. Sometimes it's offset, but sometimes we we call them segments, but they are not necessarily um, offset from one another. But but in any case, towards the the, the end of these ridge segments, uh, we, we systematically find evidence for detachment faulting. So we can assess that about 50% of the length of uh, slow spreading ridges is in this uh, detachment faulting uh, context. Uh, so that's about, uh, if you make the calculation, it's about 15,000 kilometers of ridge. So it's it's by no way insignificant. So going back to, uh, to to the questions, how much serpentinization? Well, the problem is that when we do geology on, on these uh, structures, we only see the surface and the surface is very close to the fault surface. I will come back to that. So we don't see what's at depth. The way we have to see what's at depth is to look at geophysical data. And the most efficient geophysical data to, to assess the, what's at depth is uh, the seismic velocity. And, and I, I, I won't go into too many details, but maybe just a little bit of, of this uh, sketch that is compilation of seismic velocity profiles from various uh, settings. The, the gray, um, uh, area shows you a, a bunch of seismic velocity profiles in more uh, segment center type crust, type, lit type oceanic lithosphere. Oh, I've lost, okay. And the colored uh, ones show you places that are detachment dominated. And, and you see quite a lot of variability in these, uh, in these seismic structures. But, but, but the, the common thing is that when you have gabbros, Dominant, dominant in the in the um, outcropping geology, uh, then then you have these very fast seismic profiles uh, in yellow, and uh, I think a little bit, yeah, in yellow in yellow and dashed green, but but towards the high end, and then when you have mostly sub peridotites, variably serpentinized peridotites, you have these uh, these uh, lower velocity profiles that tend to be uh, linear with depth, and uh, because serpentinization has an immediate effect on, 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 on physical properties, there is a linear relation between the degree of serpentinization and seismic velocity. So you can, you can kind of directly translate these. If you assume that it's only peridotite, you can directly translate these in person serpentinization and uh, you can assess, oops, sorry, you, you can assess then uh, the, the, the Overall serpentinization rate in this uh, in this uh, velocity section. Of course, we know that we also recover gabbros, so it becomes a little bit more complicated to interpret. 
So that's that's the idea is to to use these as a proxy to know where we have serpentine and uh, how much there is. Uh, there are two immediate problems with this uh, proxy. The first one is that the seismic models they have a pixel that is very large. It's uh, it's a few hundred meters. In other words, uh, if you get a seismic velocity that I've lost my pointer again, okay, that indicates that you have a 50% serpentinization, it might actually be that that over 100 meters or 200 meters, you've got half of it at 100% and the other one completely pristine, which of course is completely different from the point of view of uh, petrology and and, uh, and and all the other reactions, etc. The other problem is that if you look at uh, here, you see that five, there are quite a few places uh, in the uppermost lithosphere that have ve seismic velocity below five kilometers per second. And five kilometers per second corresponds to 100% uh, to serpentinization in this diagram. So what it means is that in the upper kilometers, you cannot use the proxy to know the, the seismic, the, the serpentinization rate. Uh, and uh, and what what the reason is that the seismic velocity in this uppermost one or one or two, two kilometers they're not controlled by lithology they are controlled by fluctuation. So with these uh, limitations in mind, uh, I, I, I here I propose a, a calculation, and this calculation is going to be a calculation of a of a time average serpentinization rates. And uh, the way it's time average is, okay, we say we have the actual domain and that's the place where everything happens. The tectonics, the, the magmatism, the hydrothermal circulation, the serpentinization. And then, and then we, we assume that once, once we're outside this actual domain, and mind you at slow spreading ridges, this actual domain is typically not very much younger than one million years. Okay, so 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 it means that in order to get out of the actual domain, you 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 here you will have something that is maybe seven hundred thousand to one million year, and and so it's time average over one million year, which which is quite long, uh, especially as we will see just after, uh, compared to the time scales of hydrothermal venting, that that we can study also. And so if you do that, you, you get a time average serpentinization, right? The calculation is a little bit uh, complicated, but 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 it's all pretty straightforward, really. It's complicated to 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 explain in five minutes, in two minutes, but uh, but uh, you take a, a, an exhumation rate, so a rate of movement along the fault, and we, you take a, you choose a velocity structure. So in this calculation, I've, I've chosen one from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Uh, and uh, and then you translate it into uh, serpentinization uh, rates in this this is shown here. So you have the the seismic velocity, the equivalent uh, serpentinization rates, and and here you make hypothesis. You have a low range that that corresponds to having uh, quite a few gabbros and and a maximum serpentinization that is only 86 percent. And then you have a maximum that would be no gabbros and 100% and serpentinization. But you see it's the same order of magnitude. So, so you, you have this estimate, and, and that represents the volume of fresh pruritotides that must be serpentinized per year and per kilometer of ridge axis in order to produce this uh, crustal structure once you leave the actual region. And then, of course, as I said, you have another indication of, uh, of fluxes of serpentinization that's coming from ultramafic hosted hydrothermal uh, fields uh, that, that vent um, uh, serpentinization derived fluids such as hydrogen and methane. Uh, so you have two, two types of, 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 of these vents. You've got uh, the rainbow type with the very high fluxes of black smoker type fluid, high temperature, and you've got the, the lost city uh, uh, type uh, uh, vents where the fluxes are very low and, and there is no um, no metal in it's uh, It's very different. So using the estimates of the venting fluxes in these, uh, in, in these uh, um, hydrothermal fields, and, and the hydrogen and methane concentration in their fluids, uh, one can infer, I would say, near instantaneous active serpentinization rates. Near instantaneous because the hydrogen and the methane, they're 
they won't stay at least uh, they, they it won't take them forever. It won't take them hundred thousand years to get out. So, so you can you can get insights on, on 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 the rates of active serpentinization, and and you can also I'll show you get some insights on into where this active serpentinization might might occur. And uh, so the rainbow is is the best studied example. It's uh, located here. It's along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It's in one of these uh, segment end settings. Uh, so it's uh, it's it's the foothold of a probably no inactive, uh, presently inactive detachment, and uh, it's a melt field, ultramafic hosted vent field, and there is seismic evidence just below the field. The field is this little triangle, and and there is uh, seismic evidence a few kilometers below. For, for a lot of flatline reflectors that are interpreted as melt seals or possibly uh, former melt seals that are no hot gabbros. And um, it's most likely that uh, active serpentinization that produces the hydrogen and the methane in the rainbow fluids comes out of active serpentinization uh, in the region uh, near these seals or, or above these seals. So that tells us where where it occurs, uh, and and then and then one one thing you can do is uh, is uh, again it's a calculation it's it's more it's less straightforward than the other ones, the other one. But but what what we what we do is we we take the, the available estimates on the um, uh, venting fluxes at Rainbow, and that's based on helium three uh, plume study. And we take the n number of free uh, hydrogen content, and uh, so we get this flux of hydrogen uh, at 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 Rainbow. This estimate it might be a little high because I th I think the the Prim study uh, yields pretty high um, uh, venting fluxes, but but in any case, even if it's pretty high, um, it's it's as you see here, it's several orders of magnitude higher than the hydrogen flux that would be estimated per kilometer of ridge axis for the time integrated serpentinization rate at, at rainbow uh, with the lowest, um, uh, here it's calculated for the, I think for the lowest um, serpentinization rate. And also, but, but it's calculated for one of, there are myriads of serpentinization reactions that don't produce the same amount of, of hydrogen. So in that case, it's using serpentinization reaction that produces a, a lot of hydrogen, and, and so you get this value. And, and what we can take from that is, uh, well, there are two, two ways. Of course, maybe maybe Rainbow is uh, gathering hydrogen and, and methane that has been produced over tens of kilometers of ridge axis by serpentinization, but that's highly unlikely. Okay, and, and so what it means is that the serpentinization rates below Rainbow are much more than the time average rates. And uh, so, so that tells us that when when we are have a, a hydrothermal system that is magma fueled, uh, we are serpentinizing very efficiently. And uh, and uh, here it's a little cartoon that shows you what what a, a black smoker system uh, is made of. It's made of of a of, of a very uh, high flux of melt of heat from melt and and a hydrothermal system that is allowed to go all the way uh, as as close as it, as it can to this melt to extract uh, about the same heat flux than is produced by the melt and uh, so so we would have rapid serpentinization of the ultramafic basement in this context uh, possibly high temperature serpentinization uh, which which is near the kinetic optimum of about uh, 300 degrees, which allows it to, to produce a lot of, of serpentine, and, and possibly high water rock ratios, uh, just because uh, there is so much fluid that is fluxed through these systems. But as I will show you later, uh, it's difficult to find the samples to test this hypothesis. It's maybe even impossible. Uh, this Another thing is that this configuration is transient. Uh, we know that it is transient because because the estimated magmatic heat fluxes for rainbow are also much higher than the time average melt fluxes for for this area. So so these systems are are transient. 
Okay, and on the other hand, you have the the lost city type systems, uh, in which in in which uh, the the, the unmembered fluids contain about the same amount of hydrogen, uh, but but the fluxes, the fluid fluxes are very, very, very much lower, and there is actually no published estimates. Uh, but but it's 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 well possible that uh, that the fluxes at Lost City could be consistent with ongoing serpentinization at the time average rate for for this uh, particular ridge location. Uh, we can reach the same conclusion for the the. The old city hydrothermal field that was uh, newly, relatively newly discovered, uh, um, similar site, uh, similar to the city at the southwest Union Ridge. Okay, so so in that context, we could say that maybe we have slower serpentinization of ultramafic basements in a non-magma fueled low energy hydrothermal system. We could infer that uh, this occurs at relatively low temperature, maybe near uh, not near kinetic, maybe not minimum, I shouldn't have said that, but at lower, less favorable kinetic conditions and, and possibly lower water work ratio. But again, we don't, as I argue, we don't have the samples to, to, to check that. And, uh, and then the last thing is that uh, uh, because it's close to time average uh, fluxes, it might very well be a, a very long lasting and, and, and stable configuration that goes on for well, goes on for nearly the one million year it takes for the for the for the the, the newly formed lithosphere to leave the actual region. Okay. So so now, how much we have all these questions? What do we learn from serpentinized pyridotite samples? Well, the samples we have, we can actually learn uh, quite a lot about uh, about uh, all of these questions. And I show you here examples from a paper based on samples from the Southwest Indian Ridge, but, but you could have the similar conclusions for uh, samples from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Uh, the, the, what it shows here are two samples. One sample shows the nice uh, mesh texture, and, uh, and it shows that uh, in the center of mesh texture, you, you still have quite a lot of, uh, of olivin. So, the conclusion to make it short is that the mesh texture is controlled by tightly spaced microfractures uh, and commonly corresponds to less than 100% serpentinization. Uh, so, of course, that would uh, suggest uh, relatively low water work ratios. Um, and, and then you have this sample in which the mesh texture is still visible in the core of this uh, area, but there have been later fractures that are more widely spaced that have promoted further serpentinization and also recrystallization of several generations of serpentine. And, and again, it's, uh, it's typical of abyssal serpentinized pyridotite. And these later generation of serpentine, well, as I said, they are controlled by more widely uh, spaced microfractures. Okay, and, and I said that already. And uh, then you can, you can look at these. Uh, you can look at the serpentine species, see see what species we crystallize, recrystallize, etc. You can also look at uh, at uh, stable isotopes. And and here I show you an example in which we did a very careful study of of the stable isotope composition of the different types of serpentines in in these samples, separating the earliest mesh texture from the latest. Um, what we call veins, but that's recrystallized serpentine. And we notice that there is a, a decrease in the delta O18. And, oops, and this delta O18 could very well be interpreted as, a, as okay, that we, we've, the water rock ratio was enough to reach equilibrium, so it was somewhere here. And, and, uh, and what we are witnessing is an increase of temperature during serpentinization. But we prefer to interpret it as, as, uh, as okay, we are witnessing something that hasn't reached equilibrium, at least not uh, for the earliest episodes of serpentinization. And therefore, what we are looking at is, a, is, is, a, is possibly serpentinization at nearly constant and high temperature with an increasing water work ratio which is really in keeping with what we see um, geologically in the sample. So okay. you have another five minutes. Okay, but I'm, I'm almost done. 
Okay. So, 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 so that's what we can learn from. I mean, there are other things we can learn, but but broadly speaking, that's interesting things we learned from these samples, uh, from abyssal uh, serpentinized pyridotite samples from these detachment settings. But the problem, and I go back to the same diagram as at the beginning, is that these samples, they either come from dredges or from very short drill holes, because we've got nicely deep drill holes in gabbros, but none in serpentinized pyridotites. And, and so, and, and so they, they all represent pyridotite that has been serpentinized uh, very close to the fault because the, all of this, all the seafloor in this context is, is actually the exhumed fault zone. So all of these samples, if you want to follow them to where they were coming from, they came from very close to the, to the fault. And, and, then, and there might be, um, it's pretty likely that there are serpentinization systems that are very specific uh, to this uh, context. While we know from, from looking at crustal velocity structure that most of the serpentinization actually occurs within the footfall of, of, the, of the detachment and uh, at depth uh, for which we actually don't have um, samples. So I'm sorry to, to have a disappointing uh, conclusion, but my take home points would be that uh, uh, first that the seismic crustal thicknesses at ultramafic seafloor locations uh, require serpentinization to depth of up to five kilometers in the foot walls of actual detachment falls. I say up to five kilometers because in this place um, we studied at the Southwest Indian Ridge uh, where there are almost no gabbros. Um, we do have, um, um, we only reach mantle velocity at five kilometers depth. So it means that we've got some serpentinization down to five kilometers. So it means that we, we need to serpentinize these away from the fault. Uh, but uh, abyssal serpentinized pyridotite samples likely represent only near fault serpentinization systems. Okay. And, and, then, and then the third one would be that uh, for what happens from, for, from, this, from the VANT studies, we are looking at things that very likely ha happen presently uh, in the foothold. So they are the interesting things, but we don't, we don't really get the samples, or at least not the samples of the deeper part of these hydrothermal systems. But we, we do know that we have two types. Clearly, we have a, a type that is associated with the injection of gabbros uh, and the production of black smokers. And in that, in that type, the, the serpentinization rates are very rapid. Okay, and, th and then I put that uh, maybe there are high temperature and high water rock ratios, but really I, we don't know. Uh, and, and also it's transient, that's clear. And then, and then we have a, um, a lower weight of serpentinization, uh, possibly uh, very long lasting uh, uh, in the foot wall, uh, in locations where melt is not being emplaced, or at least not being emplaced within reach of hydrothermal systems. So it might be emplaced at deeper levels, but, uh, and that produces either lost city type or, or, or also possibly diffuse hydrothermal systems uh, such as the Saldania systems or even systems that we don't that we haven't um, identified yet and and it's probably it's most probably low T because there is no magmatic heat for this one there is not much uh, of a question mark uh, um, and and it's it's Again, it's going to be long lasting and the limitation should be the availability of hydrospheres and that will be controlled by, by tectonics. So that's, that's the, 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 key, the, the key take home points of, uh, of this talk. Uh, 